In this video, I will be performing two pieces by Jean-Nicolas Geoffroy, Rabat Joie Charmant and Détachement de la Grande Pièce de Joie. Since both pieces have slightly unusual titles, we'll first look at how they fit within Geoffroy's works and then discuss the titles in more detail. If you haven't watched my previous videos devoted to Geoffroy, here is a brief overview regarding his works and how they have been transmitted to us. All of Geoffroy's harpsichord music survives in a single manuscript titled Livre des pièces de clavecin de tous les temps naturels et transposés. It was copied by an unknown scribe after Geoffroy's death and now belongs to the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. Incidentally, it is the largest collection of harpsichord music from 17th century France. Most of the pieces are dance movements arranged in suites, with several of the suites presented in more than one tonality, something implied in the title of the manuscript. Rabat Joie Charmant and Détachement de la Grande Pièce de Joie appear very near the end of the manuscript. The title of each of the two pieces is followed by a short description that suggests both pieces were part of a larger work called Grand Pièce de Joie. Let's look at the titles and descriptions in more detail. Rabat Joie Charmant can be translated as the charming spoil sport. Since the word joie also appears in the title of the main work, in other words, the Grand Pièce de Joie, perhaps Geoffroy is engaging here in a kind of wordplay. After the main title, we read Qui est la suite de la Grand Pièce de Joie de l'Opéra du dit Geoffroy? In other words, which is the continuation of the Grand Pièce de Joie from the works of the aforementioned Geoffroy. For the second piece, we read Détachement de la Grande Pièce de Joie tiré de son opéra de pièce de clavecin. In other words, the Détachement de la Grande Pièce de Joie is taken from his works of harpsichord pieces. And from now on, since the title is a little long, I may refer to this piece simply as Détachement. Perhaps the first question you may have is exactly what détachement means in this context. It was certainly the first question I had when I read the title. Unfortunately, I'm not sure about the answer. I suspect it could serve as an indication that the piece forms a part of and was taken from, i.e. detached, from the Grand Pièce de Joie, something further amplified by the word tiré in the description but I cannot find any information about this anywhere, so I don't know to what extent my explanation is valid. The other perplexing aspect of this description is that, according to the scribe, this piece, and by extension probably also the Grand Pièce de Joie, were part of Geoffroy's harpsichord music, his Pièce de Clavecin. And yet, when you examine the score, you realize that this is definitely a piece for organ. As you will observe when you follow the score with the recording, there are indications for registration changes that refer to an organ, like grand clavier, symbolized by the letter G, petit clavier, or the positif, symbolized by the letter P, and echo. This is the echo division, or the fourth manual of a large organ. Even more crucially, at least when it comes to performing it on a harpsichord, the last section of the piece contains a low G that has to be played by the pedal on an organ. Not only is it impossible to incorporate with all the other notes that have to be played by the left hand, it is also supposed to be sustained for several measures since it functions like a pedal point. So, on a harpsichord, it would have to be repeated several times. Therefore, there is really no way to play that section 
using only the two hands unless you completely leave out that low G. And I will explain later in the introduction how I solved that problem. Finally, the two pieces have different tonal centers. Rabat Joie Charmant is in G minor, while Détachement is in C minor. Although keep in mind that they do not exactly follow the conventions of major minor tonality. Yet another issue concerns the purpose for writing these pieces. If from looking at Détachement, we are to assume that Grand Pièce de Joie as a whole was an organ work, then at least from the title, it certainly does not sound like a liturgical work. And that means it could not have been intended for the church. On the other hand, finding an organ with several keyboards and the corresponding sonorities outside a church setting would probably be challenging as well. In previous videos devoted to Geoffroy's music, I have mentioned his oftentimes unusual and extremely daring harmonic language, which has even led some commentators to interpret the presence of such unprepared and prominent harmonic clashes as a sign that Geoffroy was not a particularly competent composer. Personally, I completely disagree with that assessment because, as I have argued before, if one delves deeper into his music, there is definitely logic and careful planning behind what may at first appear as a chaotic harmonic surface. If you want to know more about my reasoning, I would encourage you to watch my previous videos devoted to his music. And since his music is definitely underperformed, this will also help you become familiar with his uniquely colorful and distinctive musical language. Here, let me briefly identify some recurring characteristics of his harmonic language, since they all appear, sometimes with a vengeance, in these two pieces. I think David Fuller, writing in The New Grove, summarizes the distinctive harmonic features of Geoffroy's music quite well. Quote, he was fond of mixing the major and minor scales and was prodigal with the resulting false relations. The part writing is often harmonically out of phase, producing anticipations, retardations, and clashing seconds. His textures sometimes generate complete seventh and ninth chords in such a way as to make them sound like chords in their own right. End quote. And now, let's look at each of the two pieces, beginning with Rabat Joie Charmant. This is a through-composed piece based on a short motive that at first generates a polyphonic, imitative texture. Indeed, the first impression may be that of a fugal composition, because the main motive is consecutively stated in each of the three voices that are successively introduced in the first few measures. Let me demonstrate this for a minute. So the main motive is this one. And right now we hear it in the middle voice. Now we're going to hear it in the soprano. And now in the lower voice. So up to here it sounds imitative, but if you were to continue, for example, it starts wandering off a little bit. So the remainder of the piece is much more freely conceived than that. If we look at the main motive more closely, we can see that Geoffroy is already playing harmonic games with us. The piece is supposed to be in G minor, but the presence of B naturals make it seem as if there is a stronger pull 
towards C. And I mean this because this almost sounds like G. And what is going to happen after this is going to actually emphasize a tonic center of C. And here we are in C major, but immediately we also color it a little bit by going to C minor. In fact, the first real G minor chord occurs in measure 9, but it doesn't sound like the tonic since it's in second inversion. We have to wait until measure 16 to get a G minor chord in root position, but its occurrence is so fleeting that, once again, its importance is undermined. To me, the piece sounds harmonically unstable until we get to measure 20, and even then, the music seems to immediately wander elsewhere harmonically. In fact, the piece seems to resist settling in one particular tonality throughout its duration. As is typical of Geoffroy, there are lots of extended chords, and by that I mean chords that go beyond simple triads. This involves stacking additional thirds above a triad, so for instance, if we have a triad and, and we add another third, we get a seventh. If we add another third, we get a ninth, etc. The frequent use of such extended chords is a hallmark of Geoffroy's musical language, as is his propensity for highlighting the dissonances such chords may contain. And there are several memorable moments in this piece where we get some very delicious dissonances. Let me show you a couple of those. One of them happens uh, between measures 17 and 18, where we get these sonorities. <laughs> Here we are dealing with an 11th chord, triad, 7th, 9th, 11th. And then, depending on how you hear it, to me at least there is an even more delicious dissonance in measure 26, where we get these two sonorities. And what I said before about um, highlighting dissonances, what Geoffroy does is that he highlights the fact that we have a minor ninth within this extended chord. You don't have to have it so prominent, but this is one of the things that Geoffroy likes to do. He makes these dissonances very prominent. So we have this minor ninth and then... If you try to collect all of the different notes, you will find that, once again, we have another 11th chord. In previous videos, I have said that such frequent use of extended chords can make some of Geoffroy's music sound very jazzy, because such chords also belong to the harmonic vocabulary of jazz music. However, Ravageua Charmant, at least the way I hear it, goes beyond sounding like a Baroque composition with a jazzy flavor, and in many respects, its sound world doesn't fit within 17th century France. As a matter of fact, at times it arguably doesn't even sound like a Baroque composition at all. Especially certain passages containing a multitude of extended chords would not be out of place in a performance by Thelonious Monk, who, like Geoffroy, also reveled in harmonic dissonances. I'm sure you have heard before the notion that certain pieces of music seem to transcend the time and place they were written, although sometimes 
This is used as an excuse to not engage with the musical language and performing conventions of the particular era. In this case, it's not necessarily a matter of Rabat Joie Charmant transcending its time and place. Rather, it does not seem to belong to a particular time and place at all. Let's turn now to the Détachement de la Grande Fiesse de Joie, which shares two attributes with Rabat Joie Charmant, in that it is primarily made up of chordal sonorities and is also through composed. However, this is where the similarities end. In contrast to the monothematic and essentially polyphonic nature of Rabat Joie Charmant, Détachement is made up of several very distinct and contrasting sections, while its chordal sonorities are primarily homophonic in nature, or, especially in one particular section, are simply articulating an unusual and daring harmonic progression. Let's look at this section for a moment, since it requires a more imaginative interpretive response. The score simply shows a series of block chords in half notes. So if I were to play the beginning, we get something like this. Etc., etc. If we recall that this piece was intended to be performed on an organ, then we need to keep in mind that an organ is able to sustain these chords, and of course this ability is going to influence how we choose to interpret them. On the other hand, the harpsichord has much less sustaining power and thus elicits a much different interpretive response. Clearly, there can be different solutions, but what I decided to do is to use a variety of arpeggiations. My choices in how I arpeggiated the individual chords were guided by the harmonic content of the passage and the way I wanted to treat the individual sonorities. For instance, if I wanted to highlight a particular chord, I would play a more extensive arpeggiation. In addition to arpeggiations, I also added a few passing notes or short elaborations as a means of connecting chords or further enriching them. Finally, I want to briefly discuss two instances in the piece where I had to come up with different performing solutions since I was playing a harpsichord and not an organ. The first instance has to do with the opening two phrases, which are meant to be played twice, first on the grand clavier and then on the positif. And when you follow the score during the performance, you will see the relevant indications. Here's what the first phrase would sound like with the repeat. As you can see, it is easy to translate this effect on a harpsichord by playing on the lower manual the first time and the upper manual the second time. The trouble is that the third phrase is supposed to be performed on the echo manual, so now a third timbre is necessary. Again, there are ways of achieving this on a harpsichord, but not with my choice of using just the lower manual eight foot stop as my basic sound. And my reasoning for doing that has to do with the fact that, personally speaking, I like how extended chords resonate when I play them on a single eight foot stop. So I didn't observe these first two repeats and simply played through the opening two phrases. This enabled me to play the third phrase, the one supposed to be performed on the echo manual, on the upper manual of the harpsichord. The second instance has to do with a low G pedal point that appears in the last several measures of the piece 
and is meant to be sustained throughout. As I mentioned before, this is really intended to be played by the pedal on an organ and cannot be included with everything else that the two hands have to play. What I did in this case was to use the technique of overdubbing. That means I recorded the entire piece and in the final section I played everything except the low G. Then, while playing back the recording, I made a second recording playing only the low G and then mixed the two recordings together. Since I could not sustain the note as I could have on an organ, I had to repeat it a few times and here my choice was to rely as much as possible on the resonance of the harpsichord so that I would not repeat it too many times and thus run the danger of calling too much attention to it. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.